Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another meeting of the Research Triangle PowerShell User Group. My name is Mike Kanakis, and tonight is the beginning of February 2024, and tonight we're going to be talking about a really interesting module called PipeScript that can do some pretty amazing things. But before we get to that and our host this evening, let me welcome in my co-host. Hey, Phil. Phil Bossman, how are you, buddy? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Yeah. So. Um, Pretty interesting topic we have tonight. Um, I guess we should start off before we even welcome in our host, a little disclaimer. You want to give a disclaimer or would you like me to? Go ahead. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're joining us for the first time, if you're watching this at home on YouTube, our group is about sharing knowledge and helping people learn PowerShell. We feature all types of topics, all levels of speakers. And if this is your first time joining us, we want you to understand that our speaker tonight, which we're going to welcome in in about two minutes, is a PowerShell developer, uh, former Microsoft employee, and one of the brightest minds in the PowerShell community. He can flat out write code better than almost anybody else I've ever met. And so the level of talks that this gentleman engages in are deeper than most of the topics that we do. And so if we are talking about college level classes, you have 100, 200, 300, and 400. Usually our talks with this gentleman are in the 400 to 500 level. And so please just understand that if you're learning, looking to learn PowerShell, our channel on YouTube has 150 videos that contain lots of different skill levels. Our next couple of meetings will be back to the regular content, but tonight we're going to go really deep. We're going to dive in. And so who is our speaker tonight, Phil? What can you tell the people about our, our esteemed guests? Yeah, well, uh, you know, James Brundage is, is our, our speaker for tonight. You know, he's a jack of all trades, you know, especially a master of uh, PowerShell itself, as far as I'm concerned. You know, he's been, you know, helping grow the PowerShell language community with a bunch of other, you know, modules and stuff. The things he does with PowerShell, it's kind of like he's trying to push the language beyond what, you know, you normally would see, you know. Um, and uh, he's got a company, you know, Start Automating. So he does a bunch of stuff in the community for consulting and stuff like that. So if you're looking for a thing, I mean, he's probably always open for clients at that point. But uh, yeah, let's let's bring James on. How you doing, James? Uh, I'm all right. Uh, hey, man. Turn a camera on. Uh, Welcome to the Touching park. on a couple of points real quickly. First, uh, always love new and interesting work. If you have new and interesting work, I'll be putting contact information at the end. If you're not going to watch the whole thing, just scroll through the whole recording until you see the contact info. Um, two, uh, I feel like this might be actually a pretty shallow talk, although your mind <laughs> will still be blown. I promise this, <laughs> this will still be pretty crazy. Uh, it's just one of those things that you can use without having to deeply understand how it works and actually a pretty shallow path to this part of things working. It's yeah, just similar. My, my, my comment to uh, James was, Hey, my message is going to be like, it's a magic trick. You know that it, there's somehow it does it. And you just accept that it's magic and just do it and just, you know, consume it and let it wash over you. And so that's when, when I've had my precursor with this is, is I'm super excited just to see what everybody else reacts and, and how we can go with this. So I'm excited. By script. So, yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to try to throw this up here. Um, do we want to do a proper screen sharing or do what? Uh, yeah, yeah, screen screen yeah, we want to unfortunately screen that'll screen. be less memes, <laughs> but we'll we'll work with that. Well, we so all with. right. So before you get started, James, and so you know, I just want to uh, first of all welcome you here tonight. Thanks for sharing with us tonight, and I just want to let people know that James has a wide range of topics that he covers, and so James is going to be talking about PipeScript tonight and some of the things that you can do with PipeScript. And like, like Phil said, is you're essentially going to see a magic trick, and you may not understand what's happening behind the scenes, but it, the end result is going to be pretty cool. But what I want to point out is, is that um, James, when we talk with James, he's one of those guys that has lots of ideas. And if you make a run all and over to his GitHub repo, I think you're going to find dozens of interesting modules that he's created that run the gamut from like home automation to building code for you, to writing help, to speeding up the things that you do. Um, you know, most of the speakers that we have sort of swim in one or two lanes. And James is one of those guys that 
swims in every lane. And so you never know what you're going to find in his repository, in his GitHub repository. So uh, yeah, I, I try to build a lot of fun toys. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. I really want to get people to take a look because they're going to see this and they're going to think one thing and then they're going to go to your repo and they're going to be like, oh, my God, this guy does all this weird stuff. So um, and oh, weird yeah. meaning awesome. Right. Really. I mean, variety. I, I really try to go bit mad scientist with it uh not to be too crass but rick without the douchebaggery uh that that's kind of the life goal there um at least one of them so let's let's go for the brief introduction of some mad science before we get into the magic trick and show you how it all works okay sure so i'm james James Brundage from Start Automating. I was on the PowerShell team between 2006 and 2010, which is when PowerShell V2 and 3 were formed. Those are when lots of major portions of PowerShell, like script commandlets and splatting and command metadata and events and remoting uh, and classes all kind of started to come into place. Uh, classes, I think, was a little bit later. Uh, I started one of the first PowerShell shops in 2010, uh, basically sort of wander the earth, at least remotely working and helping interesting people with their PowerShell jobs or less interesting people with their automation needs or anything in between. I've helped quite a lot of people with their PowerShell over the years. And I've built a lot of the tool or a lot of tools for the community. Uh, thanks for the very good lead in. And you definitely should check out github.com slash start automating. I probably should have included the link at this point in the presentation, but it'll be there later. Um, what I tend to do is think about basically the problem space of PowerShell overall and continue to kind of grow and expand what it does because that benefits us all it lets us all do more stuff and that's kind of the name of the game doing more with less and i'm a jack of all trades and a master of powershell so we're going to talk about running other languages today again jack of all trades master of powershell this might be a powershell user group but let's be open-minded powershell's already got a really great ecosystem and you know Nothing against it. There are lots of modules there. There's lots of stuff you can do. There's lots of good organization about or within it. But if PowerShell could play nice with everyone, that ecosystem could grow exponentially. And anybody that's been doing PowerShell for more than, I don't know, half an hour, hour and a half, will probably realize that it'll work better with stuff that's .NET than non.NET. You know, and it doesn't end up being so useful to bridge the divide between other languages. So that's one of the many reasons why I started building TypeScript. And TypeScript is a language built in PowerShell. And it lets PowerShell play nice with everything. And here we get to go into crazy demo mode. Can everybody see the screen? It's good. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and import module. At this point, this release is ready to go. We'll click release at the end of this recording. Um, but uh, everything I do here, you should be able to do as well, or almost. What we're going to do first is we're going to open up a hello world in JavaScript with a little bit of a bad geek joke. Now, for a little bit of demonstration sake, I'm going to actually close this file and I'm going to go, hello, JavaScript. Ah, let me uncurse the demo gods there, close out. Pretty new brand new task. Sorry about that. Okay, fresh thing. If I have a normal PowerShell window, and I say just hello.javascript, it'll try to open that file because PowerShell does not really have a concept natively of file extensions, okay? It doesn't have a way to batch out files to different places and that, well, limits what PowerShell can do and how seamlessly it can work with other stuff. 
So I'm going to go ahead and import TypeScript now. Hey, hey James, a quick question. So yeah? when you ran that Hello.js, yeah. uh, what actually happened? I mean, I know it didn't execute, but um, what did actually PowerShell happens, just throw it away? PowerShell invokes it as a process, which basically asks Windows to handle it however it would be like. If it was an executable, it would run. Oh, so I guess you're also saying, so in that in your Windows says, hey, a JavaScript file says, hey, that's a text file, open it in VS Code. So that's why it opened in VS Code. So if you had it you know, associated with Notepad, it would open Notepad, correct? Right. It okay. would open in whatever your default setting was per operating system. And that's kind of part of the problem if you stop to think about it, because file associations across operating systems are a whole nightmare that nobody really wants to get into. And even though you can use PowerShell across all the operating systems at this point, using it across different files is still painful. But we're getting ahead of the magic. So now I'm going to go run hello.js, if I ever can tab complete it. And I have imported PipeScript. And I do get my bad joke. I can assign that to a variable. Yay. That works. I can do that for other languages too. So we can call any language from PowerShell. So so but the kind of magic at this point is that you're actually invoking the JavaScript, you're invoking the, the Python script. And because that script does all it does is write to the cons write out host, that that's what it's doing. But if you had a script that, you know, hey, went and did some other work, it would just run it natively just by running py. That's right. That's 100% right. And this is where this is a very easy angle, I think, to come into TypeScript. TypeScript can do a lot for you, but this is a big, simple thing. It can let you seamlessly work with any language that is defined, any language that has an interpreter. And let me kind of walk into what that means and kind of a little bit of how this is working. So I'm just kind of walking through our code base here, and I'm going to go look at, well, let's look at Python to start. There's a file, Python language PSPS1. This is a source file for PowerShell. Again, TypeScript is a language written in PowerShell. It produces PowerShell in any other language you want. And this here basically says, here's a bunch of information related to the Python language. This is going to become an object. We only need two pieces for this to work. One is the file pattern, okay? And that file pattern kind of obviously helps us figure out, oh, you're a Python file, cool. I got it now. The other one is the interpreter. And these aren't really rocket science pieces of information. It's okay, your Python file there, your interpreter here. And it can be the name of a command or a script block or a resolve command. And you can also have trailing or leading arguments. So this gives you a very easy way to just wire up any language. And I can actually go look at this object by saying pslanguage.python. There we go. It gives me a nice little formatted object around that. And I can format list if I want to see more. There's quite a bit more information attached to this. In fact, Python, like many of the languages, has templates that I can use. I can go get a Hello World template. And I can go run that produce my hello world. Hell, I can even pass it a message. And I can go ahead and set that into a file. Set content, we're PowerShell people. I mean, are we anymore? Aren't we kind of moving beyond <laughs> that now? <laughs> Fair point, touche. To to kind of misquote uh, a certain you know old doc uh, where we're going, I don't think we need roads. So, ah, uh, yeah, this is this is a big little fun. 
let's go up one more level. What's actually going on here? If I get command cool Python, it's an alias. What's an alias to? It's an alias to command invoke interpreter. A uh, brief plug here, by the way, my fancy output is courtesy of a module called Posh, which was written with PipeScript and easy out to other modules that I write. It makes output fancier. Downloading it would be good. Anyway, plug over. So, so James, I, I, every time uh, I watch you demo stuff, I have a thousand questions. And so uh, I, just a thousand. And here I, here I go already. And so I don't know if what I'm going to ask is something that you're going to present later on. So I'll just ask it. And if it is, you just tell me to shut up. But I'm curious, you have PowerShell executing another language by using an interpreter. And so it's running the code, but things are coming back to the screen in some things. And so when things come back, is this the typical PowerShell stuff where I run something in some crappy language? That maybe is text, and now it's coming back as PowerShell objects, and I can do all the cool PowerShell stuff with it. Or is that uh, something different? Um, somewhere in between is the right way to put it. Uh, if I give you a longer answer here, we're going to get into another plug and sidetrack, but a very quick version of it before I get too off base. Um. If you're not familiar with it, I have a module called uget. Uget gives you git as objects. So I can git log get member. Or just, you know, see the formatted output. Or take the first 10 logs or actually use some PowerShell tab expansion, take the first 10 logs and uh, sort object by commit date. Descending. Okay. Object pipeline's great. Uh, this is working with similar magic. Um, and there is a part of TypeScript that relates to parsing that works very close to identically to the way this works in UGET. So, if you have just any Python script you run into or any Hello World or whatever in JavaScript, it's not going to change your output for you because it's not something I feel comfortable doing on your behalf without some buy-in. If, however, it is a known JavaScript or Python file with a known parser, then I'm very happy to take the text that it comes back and turn it into objects. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, so similar, I'm looking at, at the, uh, the repository as well, and there's other languages like JSON. So that's a structure that, you know, I think a fair number of people in here understand. And so it's not so much you can execute a JSON file or it can just yeah. interpret it natively, you know. It's also PSD1. So I can just go ahead and say, oh, I have a bug here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, demo gods. Thank you. But it, it, it's essentially any file with a language description can do this. And data languages, in my mind, are fair game for interpretation because, well, their data. So let's go find another JSON file somewhere. Uh, OBS PowerShell probably has one. Please. Thank you. Cool. So if I go ahead and take that, select object expand property full name, just go ahead and grab its full path there. Ah. In that case, I'm sorry I did not get lucky again. Cursed by the demo gods. Today is not my day. Cool, full Turing complete languages only is the joke right now. And maybe I won't release right at the end of this. All right. 
Uh, kind of going back a little bit to our demo for a second. Again, Go Python Node JS. All of those you can call directly. One of the things that's coming up and cool is the inline handling of objects. If the interpreter isn't PowerShell, basically, uh, I'm going to be starting to pass things as JSON. So that should make data even easier to pass to something like Python or JavaScript, because JSON's a language basically everybody speaks. Uh, you guys got enough of the magic trick. We've done enough of this version of show and tell. Uh, do we need to kind of understand more of how it works? I can well, walk you through Invoke Interpreter. It's real short. It's nice and 70 lines at this point. All it's basically doing is saying, first, it's a free form function, no commandlet binding. This is so all the arguments you'd pass to any application aren't accidentally interpreted as PowerShell. Um, and you can get this just by not adding the commandlet binding or parameter attributes to a function. And it basically says, all right, if I was not called myself return, and if I didn't have interpreters, I couldn't map the file return. Otherwise, go over every interpreter I can, convert the arguments if I need to, find if there are parsers, and go call the command. And if there are parsers, pipe it out parser. If there weren't, call it. Fun story, these few lines I kind of lifted uh, from basically every node module that has a PowerShell CLI. They almost all have this exact sort of pattern for how they handle pipeline input or direct calls to a node script. Stuff like NPM, NPX, they do this already. So this is trickery that isn't really even mine. It's just stuff that works if you look at it the right way. The last bit of the magic is how Invoke Interpreter is even being made as the alias. And the quick answer for that is at the last second. There's a thing that happens in PowerShell, a couple things actually, pre and post command lookups. Before every command in PowerShell executes, pre-command lookup is called. After every command is resolved, post-command lookup is called. Pre-command lookup's the one we use here. And we got to do a creative trick here. We can't actually look up commands directly in it. So I've got to use two modules to make their commands to make this work, new module and import module. So I do this kind of trick to go grab it. This is a way to look up commands very efficiently. And I just basically go grab module commands and pick out new and import from there. And then, you know, some multiple assignment. They're going to come back alphabetically. So that's why it's written this way. Uh, the other thing that I want to be able to do is quickly check if a command exists. And this is another beautiful bit of trickery to know. Um, these are basically pointers to all commands that might exist but they're not enumerated until you look at them so running this is very fast but looking at single ones of them or groups of them gives me a fresh sense of what commands currently exist so if there are interpreters i try to make a match i make sure that i don't already have a command for this and then i basically create a module that sets an alias and tell you I found an interpreter there and go ahead and give you the new name back. So this last little bit of magic lets a command kind of come into existence right at the moment that you're trying to run it. And that's really cool and it works very nicely. So, so it does that at runtime? Yeah. So I don't think we've run args.py yet. And if I go ahead and say get command args.py right now, it is in fact an application. 
Now I'm going to run args.py. And I'm going to do the same thing here. And I'm going to get command args.py. And now it's become an alias. So that's the magic trick. Magic trick is just at the moment that you're saying, I want this command, it's saying, I can give you this different command. Actually, I can't give you this different command. I can make an alias for this command so that this command becomes this other command. That's the magic trick. So the magic trick is that it creates an alias on the fly that is an interpreter of calling the executable or the 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 the, yep. the, the file on in fly, but then also aware enough that it pulls in that it can take arguments at that point too and do other things. And so yep. if we look at args, I don't know, did you see what args is? Did you even show what what's in it? Because args did other things. It's kind of like outputting JSON, right? Yeah, let's go ahead and look at these two real quick. There right, so yeah. I mean I'm still stumbling my way through other languages for a bit too. This this is literally just go grab all the arguments to the file. In Node.js you get two arguments ahead that you can ignore one of them is node and the other one's the path to the file. And in Python, you have one, but they're basically okay. a variation on printing hello world. Okay. So effectively you're just doing through a loop and you're just printing a bunch of the arguments that are there because it's something that's free. So you, but that's what the code is doing. And so effectively, if you had code that does other things, but kind of the, the, the magic trick is where you just said is that you give it, args.py this string and then it goes hey i know that this is a python i know that i can have an interpreter for it because i have an interpreter and then it on the fly creates an alias so that when you call the when it's been called which you just did is it actually runs python with the arguments with, with a whole parts with it along the fly and all in code at that point right did i kind of yes wrap that in yeah in you've got it you've got it and this again is a pretty shallow path to come into PypeScript. It's it it'll just work for you. Any new language that is supported by PypeScript will just work. If you need to set an alias to a given command to make it work, that's not a problem too. Um, like one of the other examples I have is uh, I believe I have hello dot ren. Ren is just Yet another little language, you know, doesn't really matter. It's kind of loosely Google affiliated as far as I understand. But the point of the demo here is I can go ahead and try to call this. And it's going to say, hey, I don't have Ren CLI. And I can go ahead and set alias to Ren CLI. And now my Ren's working. Because it's not really doing anything that special. It's just okay, wait, working let me, off let me pause there. So let me pause there again. So from what I just understood, so if we go look at the Ren interpreter, it, expect, it expected something called Ren CLI. And so you just to find it right there. It's like, hey, I'm going to create an alias to that exe. Yep. Right? So if we go look at the Ren, that whole... I think in the Python, we saw that it uses the word Python because Python is an exe itself and it's within the scope and it's in your yep. path. So here's so, the language definition for Ren. There's its file pattern. There's its interpreter. So it was looking for an e or a word in the exe called Ren CLI. And so you yep. had to define an alias for it. But if the word Ren CLI is actually in your, you know, your not profile path, but in your path, if you could have just run Ren CLI, it would have just worked at a box. Yep. And but it actually gets a much crazier because I can also do something like Ren interpreter here is, let's call it Renny. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and, all right. So I've changed what it's going to use as the interpreter for Ren. And I'm making that an alias now too. And it works again. Okay, but again, you're just using al the alias some words w r e n n y, and but again, if it's path, because you could have just run ren cli dot exe, which yep. would have been the same. 
And if I go ahead and re-import TypeScript, by the way, I should have Ren's, you know, Ren should be back to normal. So PS yeah. language, Ren. Yeah. Its interpreter so, is Ren CLI. So the, the interpreter itself could be in the actual path to the exe potentially. But you're just Yeah, it can be the path to the executable. It can be the actual executable resolved itself. It can be a function info or name of a function. So I guess also is that looking at some of the other thing, be it Ren, be it, you know, even XML, is that there's a way in which to the interpreter is just how to invoke that object type, right? Or not even object type, but that file type, right? So you're potentially yeah. using some form to invoke that file so that when you run it at the console or even in any kind of code, it just natively knows because this other definition, this ran language, this other language just works. It does it for you and just, it, that's where the magic happens. It's, yes. that makes sense. Cool. And yeah, you're, you're getting it right away. Uh, but also, again, it is a magic trick. You don't have to know how the magic trick works. What I really love to talk about is what the magic trick brings us. So, so before you get are you to that, not entertained and amazed enough? Can we can we get a bit into that, or you guys got more questions here? Well, I got a question, and not about what you presented, but just my thought process is like, wow, this is all pretty cool. I'm just curious. What was the impetus for you to do this? Was there a, a need? Uh, there are several. Um, but the very short answer is it's a strategic long-term imperative that I don't feel like the uh, PowerShell team is yet addressing. Okay, uh, so you're trying to So I'm trying to do that. Yeah. Um, the, the very... The not too short but not too long answer is that basically... Shell or any language ecosystem is perpetually trying to win against another language ecosystem. If basically Node or Python or Go is trying to become the dominant language, it's always going to lead to technical fracturing. There's always going to be 50 different ways to do a thing. And that's good and bad. There should be competition in the market, uh, but it also prevents all languages from ever really flourishing. They can only flourish insofar as their ecosystems work. And the PowerShell ecosystem is like every other one, or has been up until this point. Uh, we play in our sandbox. It's a big sandbox. Everything in .NET's there. That's great. But we don't really play with other people's sandboxes. And that means that we're engaging strategically in the same battle the whole technical world is engaged in for the last 20, 30 years of us versus them, versus them, versus them, versus them, versus them. I would rather PowerShell unites the technical world and we get to reap the long-term benefits. And I think that's kind of the setup for the why. We talked a little, about, little bit about how it works, but kind of recap it real quick. PypeScript will let you define any language. Any language can, those will be in PS languages. Any language can have an interpreter. Those will be in PS interpreters. Any language can have a file pattern. We check every command before it runs. If the command matches the file pattern, we run the interpreter. Now, what this gives us, everything and anything. Now PowerShell can mix and match whole ecosystems. So we are not limited to just PowerShell's ecosystem. PowerShell's ecosystem can now include every other ecosystem fairly seamlessly. We can play with Python, we can use Node natively, and we can get up and go. And this lets us easily work with anything, and PowerShell can therefore be everything, everywhere, all at once. I'm trying to do these sorts of things for our communal good. Every person in the PowerShell community has 
stumbled their way through learning the language, gotten there because it's gotten it's easy. It's it's made tech more simple to approach than any other language up until this point. And that's a lot, a lot of people to reach great levels of opportunity. And the further we take PowerShell, the further we all go. So the more you support this sort of a thing, the better it'll be for all of us. The more capabilities we have, the more our value rises. And we've already seen basically how much all of our lives changed by learning just a little bit or more of PowerShell. That's why you're here. But James, let me ask you, like from a philosophical standpoint, right? I, I get oh, we it. We got a whole thing on that later. I, like I get mm. what you're saying and I totally agree with you and, and, but you know, like to play devil's advocate. So like, cause I have this problem at work now where my manager is asking my team to sort of learn and support Python and, I don't have a use case to do Python to currently. So for us, it's like, why am I learning something I don't really know how to do or, or have a use case for, right? So that's one thing. But then, so now I can say to myself, well, I can try to use PipeScript to be able to run Python files with PowerShell and I can make everybody at work be like, how the hell did he do that? Okay, that's great. But am I just, is it, is the module just enabling the execution of existing files? I can't write Python now using my PowerShell terminal, can I? Uh, we're slowly but surely getting there. That's okay. a not exactly unrelated topic. Um, but the short answer there is language translation is a major goal of TypeScript. The eventual goal here is you should be able to take PowerShell and turn it into almost any language. Okay, At so, least it so, supports the feature set of PowerShell eventually, but it's a long road to there. AI assisted or not, it's still a lot of functions to write, a lot of templates for a lot of different scenarios. If anybody wants to help, they're more than welcome to. So um, I, un I understand that and I understand what you're saying. And that was kind of why I said what I said in the lead in to introducing you, which is, the reason and the things that you do aren't always apparent. And so I get the sense here that you feel that there's a gap in our ecosystem and you feel that you have the ability to fill that gap because maybe the traditional path of the vendor who started PowerShell is not open to addressing that now. So you have a desire to extend the tool to be able to do more and more PowerShell. That's the part that I don't think that people pick up when they see this stuff. And so I get yeah. it right now. This is really a runner and then it's going to grow into more, but it's pretty yeah. like it's pretty interesting to see how this all develops. It's yeah. a lot to absorb. I know you say it's not very deep. It's a lot to build. It's a lot it's to a go lot, through. Yeah. This is, I mean, we'll, we'll cover that in a couple of slides. Let me talk about some practical applications sure. before we continue with the mind blowing stuff. Um, Let's let's talk a real simple example. Let's talk statistics, or rather, let's not. Do any of us really want to learn hard math? No. The answer is no. Python has a statistics module. Like, you can go ahead and just look up its documentation, learn how to call it to get linear regressions, like to get slopes of a line based off of data. That's really simple to do. Uh, for a more complex example, let's talk browsing. Node can embed Chromium. You can have scripts that actually basically host a browser that you can interact with. You guys want to see a quick example of that one in a second? Absolutely. Yeah, right. definitely. Let's pop, let's pop back over to that one. First, let's open it up. And this is literally copied and pasted from Chromium's, you know, module page. Okay. I might have, yeah, there, I have to do this real quick because I'm running modules globally, which is a contentious thing within a node. It's just easier for me for disk space reasons. I'm gonna do that real quick. Otherwise it would have given me some errors. And we're going to go ahead and run Chromium test. And 
There is my page. Looks like it is a blocking call. I'm going to go ahead and close that out. There we go. Didn't have any errors. Gave me the call back when it finished. So let's talk a real simple common PowerShell pain in the butt. All right, I'm trying to authenticate you to a system with OAuth. How do I do that? How do I pop a browser for you? And how do I make sure I get the loop back? I can't use start process to just open Google. I won't get a signal back when it's done. Well, this isn't that much code, right? The fact of the matter is, like most people, self-included, stumble their way through putting together code. It's it's you slice and dice this or that from Stack Overflow that you figure out how to make it work. That's the life skill. And this isn't that much to figure out how to make it work. I mean, I'm not a big JavaScript guy or a big Python guy or a big Go guy yet. But now that I can talk to that seamlessly from PowerShell, I'm more interested. And we're going to get into some fun territory as we go. Speaking of Go, I want to really kind of see how many possibilities we have. This is, like, before this, I, I tried to basically narrow it down to just one example to show you guys. And the Chromium is as close as you, you get for a bit more advanced stuff. But the fact of the matter is that this is letting whole ecosystems that already exist play with PowerShell, and those ecosystems are as huge as PowerShell's ecosystem, if not bigger. And one of the things what I that I found looking for examples for Go was this wonderful GitHub page, uh, github.com slash Avalino, awesome dash Go. And just to give you a sense this is a curated list of some other ecosystem, and I'm just hitting page down here. There's so much out there. So much out there for us to work with and play with. I want to take us back to a PowerShell classic for a second, and it's going to be a scary one, but you can do app domain colon colon current domain that's going to get your current app domain that's the thing hosting powershell and you can say get assemblies that's all the dlls that are loaded and i can say get types i might get an error or two for this because there might be an assembly or two that doesn't want to be seen that's a different topic go get assign that to all types and we're going to go ahead and ask how many types we have 28,930 types. I remember the first time I figured out this sort of pipeline and I just kind of watched this, like all of these possibilities go past my eyes. And it is a little overwhelming, all the stuff you can already do with PowerShell and .NET. And now we can mix and match every ecosystem. So it's not just .NET anymore. That's big, I think. I hope. Quick what else? Friendly reminder, this is just one part of PipeScript. PipeScript is used for a lot more. You can serve up sites in a microservice. Command for that is start PS node. We're just going to do that quick one-liner to blow minds real quick. So we're going to start a PS node that gets process on that port, assuming I hadn't already. And we're gonna go ahead and, it's not gonna be a very pretty web page, but it will work. Famous last words. There we go. Note that it's formatted just like it would be in PowerShell. All right, so, so probably, that's... Yeah, probably just happened. Hold on, so let's go back. And All go. right. Let's, let's slow this down, what just happened? So let's come back. So. One other command in TypeScript that is a PowerShell web server and a background job ran get process whenever a user hit this URL and dumped the results as HTML. 
So wait, wait, wait. Say that again. So you started a node process, which was a web server. I started a background job. It's not a separate process. Okay. So when I hit that web page, it's going to then run get process? Correct. Oh, so it's in, it's running that command at start. And so at that point, it's so running if I that refresh command. that page, it will continuously update get process. Yes. Control R, control R, control R. There's minor changes there as it doesn't like doing this sort of thing, but doesn't hate it that much. Also, right. look at how many code instances I have open. All right. So this is that blow mine thing. You know, what does that mean? Oh, I cannot do the memes and share the screen at the same time. It's a joke. It's unfortunately a joke. determined. I'm sorry. For the memes and the screen sharing, you have to join me at the Pacific PowerShell user group or turn into a screencast. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, that's that's one more facet to play with. But the big thing is it's generated and it generates a shell of a lot of code. New pipe script pops out commandlets like crazy. It does what the name describes. It helps you build commandlets and automatically generate them. Um, any star.build.ps1 file will run during the build process. And this will let us build whole modules from pure metadata. And star.psp or PypeScript template files can compile any language. Uh, I use ps.md files a lot at this point to generate better markdown, basically. Uh, to let a picture speak a thousand words and then, you know, have the math check out, I'm going to show you. James? Yes. I, I I've run into something in the in the past, the distant past. All right. Office application, and I need a dot net a dot net result, dot net function, whatever, but there's no com there's no com wrapper around. Uh you cut out there. Okay, there's there's no com wrapper around uh, .NET. Are you still with me? Am I still? Uh, with you? You're still with yeah. me. I just was loading up the next step. Step no com wrapper around .NET. A, a lot of dot yeah, a lot of .NET does not have a com wrapper, so I could not call that from within an Office application that I was writing, and. I was wondering if um, pipe PipeScript might might be called by a a 32-bit application. Granted, it's it's within Microsoft Office, which which is weird in and of itself. Provide uh, provide the results back to that that 32-bit code. Uh, that is far too in the weeds for me to answer. No I don't know is the short answer I can give you right now. Uh, I expect that it will run it like any other process. And I would also probably expect, I have not tried um, implicit interpretation on PowerShell non-core, which shows you how many craps I give about PowerShell non-core at this point. If you guys want to try it real quick, we can get that answer. If it works on non-core, then I'd expect you'd be able to call PowerShell that way. Whether it would let another application call it that way is a very different question. That's, I mean, there's there's two somewhat related questions. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's development in my distant past, and, and I just, I went, hmm, I wonder. I, I do not anticipate doing any of that in the future. Okay, then, yeah, yeah let's just keep going for a second. Uh, I'm going to go show you guys a project that was built with TypeScript and is used to build TypeScript. That project is PSSVG. Now, it's not used to build a big part of TypeScript, just used to build the logo. What PSSVG is, is, well, a module built with TypeScript that 
completely wraps the SVG standard. It goes and takes the documentation from Mozilla Developer Network about SVGs, creates PowerShell commandlets around it. That's the high level how it works. Don't need to worry about it that much though. Let's go through its quick demos. All of these demos total up to, I think, less than a megabyte, way smaller than a GIF would ever be. And we're starting to get into the cool territory. All right, wait, wait, wait. So let's let's quick pause there. So you're saying all of these SVGs, you're looking at some SVGs and all of these wait, were wait, you're saying that there's some animation. PowerShell. All and these were built with PowerShell. So generate they module SVG built file. with PipeScript that generates full commandlets for every single element in the SVG standard. And then some. And there are things of, I would say, pretty decent beauty here. This one I generally call my uh, Doctor Strange demo. All right, so I'm going to wrap that one more time again. So we're saying that PypeScript uses... PypeScript the... generates PSSVG. PSSVG generates SVGs. Yeah, yeah. But PypeScript used the documentation from of the SVG standard to then build a module that is PSSVG. And then that is correct. using PSSVG, you can then build SVGs. Yep. And in fact, we can also build PypeScript's own logo. So this is pipescript.psvg. There's an SVG. There's a definition defines some Google font that it uses, it defines a couple markers, has some text, has a few different circles that it's going to draw. I'm doing a little bit of basic math in there. It's not too complicated, but it's nice to have a full Turing complete language because SVG does not have the ability to do any math. Render all the graphics you want, do none of the math. You can see the problem, hopefully. Um, anyway, so I got a bunch of things that I'm going to need to do for each path. I'm going to go create a couple of arcs and maybe animate them. I'm going to generate a whole bunch of variations of this logo. That's what this variant match stuff looks like. There was right, so an icon again. you used in this. Go ahead. We're going to, we're going to pause again. And so this, you use VS PypeScript to generate the module that dynamically, and then that module then kind of dynamically based upon the documentation allowed you to build a, a arc path with a parameter, with an end, yep. with a sweep, all of that based upon the documentation. And yep. so you got parameters on the fly based upon the documentation. And so not on the fly, compiled. I didn't write any of that. My bots wrote that for me. Thank you very much. But but so the, I could go ahead and say get out was arc path from that examples. Yeah. So it generated it based upon the code. There was no, like, you didn't do any of that. It was just generated based upon the documentation. So if the Mozilla project says, hey, we're going to add some features to it, you'll just run this again. It'll generate some new parameters based upon whatever it generated. Yep, which means okay. that my cost of keeping up with their technology is now basically zero. Cool. Got it. Keep going. Sorry, I just wanted to level set. It's all right. So, so, so the, so the, so the skinny version is is the code that we see on the screen here. This PS1 file, we're seeing line 95, but it probably goes on another hundred. It generates lines. those. You didn't write any of this six. code. It wrote it wrote this entire file for you. No, I wrote this code. I didn't write SVG arc path directly, or maybe maybe that one I did. I've done a few things on top of the existing SVG commands. I didn't write SVG text or SVG T span. SVG marker or a polygon, SVG defs, SVG itself, all of those are commands that just automatically got generated from documentation. Hundreds of commands. I've also done this for OBS. So let's kind of go take a look at that one real quick, just in terms of command count. You know, we'll, we've got two of them imported at this point. Let's see, get command module PSSVG, and we're going to pipe that to measure object. And that has 84 commands. That seems actually lower than I'd expect. I'm gonna go check something. OBS PowerShell, on the other hand, 221. 
you said it in that fashion because you're saying that you use PS. And if I include aliases, it's 361. And, and you, you just point that out because you generated OBS PowerShell from ByteScript as well. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Okay. So if I look at this, it's 361 plus 201 commands. Now let's do that in PowerShell plus 201. So 562 commands basically without writing them directly. I only have to write their templates. I only have to figure out how to map your SVG documentation to your OB or your SVG command or your OBS WebSocket documentation to a function that calls it. There's still a little bit of work to do, but it's not that much. And once you build that fundamental layer, that layer tends to not change. Because if the company that builds a technology changes that layer, they break themselves too. So once you figure out how to work with a thing in mass, you can build a whole bunch of commandlets in mass and just work with that. And in fact, you don't have to do any of this. Anybody in the PowerShell community could have built a PowerShell module that we can leverage or use. And in fact, anybody in any community could have built a module package, whatever that language calls it, that we can now also use. That's the whole amazing point. Also, we're going to talk a little bit about mythology for a second and shapes that most people don't know by name. And that is an Ouroboros, the snake eating its own tail, because PipeScript is used to generate the technologies that are used to build PipeScript. PipeScript builds itself with PipeScript too. So PipeScript is an Ouroboros. And here we have a PowerShell file generating a bunch of SVGs, including PipeScript's logo and Ouroboros variants for it, which should be up when this releases. And we're gonna go ahead and invoke item that. And there you go. So, one more thing before we kind of get to continue the fun. ESSVG has generated uh, a little over 256 times in the last year, okay? Each time it generates, it's made four megabytes of code. That means PypeScript on one module alone has made one gigabyte of code in the last year. This is the sort of productivity levels we can all achieve basically just by approaching our problems and compiling them. Getting lots of commandlets off of a little bit of metadata. Great way to live. Okay, so picture speak, awesome. math checks out. Awesome. Are we back on this uh, road for a second? Because we want to talk about the virtuous Ouroboros now that we've identified what the hell it is. Thank you for including that image uh, in the meeting invite, by the way. It was a great pick. So the virtuous cycle is a thing that's talked about in PowerShell a fair amount, at least kind of, you know, in, in business process, at, like conversations. It basically means the more we can automate, the less everything costs. If I already have a PowerShell script that does something, I've kind of reduced its cost to close to zero. I just have to plug in parameters and then it works, right? And the more and more we do of it, the less everything costs us and our employers. Or, put more simply, the more we build, the better it gets. And PipeScript, as you might beginning, be beginning to get, takes this to a whole other level. Uh, it drops the cost of using any technology and it makes it easier to build technology. In fact, it's used to build itself. It is used to build the tools that build itself. It is the virtuous cycle incarnate or the virtuous Ouroboros. Does this kind of sort of make sense to the degree that things like this can? As it is a lot to take in. I think it's awesome. Thanks, James. Cool. Well, so hold on. So I think we should level set here because everybody has been sort of captivated by what you're doing, but there's a pretty good chat going on. And this is one of the few instances where 
nobody's answering the questions because we're all kind of figuring out what the hell you're doing. So I don't know. I feel I could use some help here, but there's been a few questions in here that was all like, right. James, can you do this? And no one, well, uh, no let's one look jumped through some chat. That, so. Sorry, I've been, I've been, yeah, yeah, spitting so, the spell. So yeah, yeah that's uh, okay. Let I bring them forward. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, okay. So, uh, David wants to know the timing of the chevrons, but there was I saw one or two others way back. So I got. Well, okay, Let, let's let's cover this one really quickly. Uh, I'll find because it's fun. One. Um, there are three different rings of chevrons running. Uh, they're in the Ouroboros design, they're going in different directions. Uh, they're each one of the outermost rings should be a minute, and second outermost, 30 seconds, third and innermost, 15 seconds. I don't remember if I'm multiplying or dividing when I do the math, but we can check the script. Uh, but this is actually a kind of cool example of where pro basic programming can lead to really harmonic design, in this case, quite literally. Like I'm taking a time scaling factor of one level and I'm I'm just multiplying or dividing and getting a design that naturally coincides literally every minute that it's been on the screen. So every single minute it will be at its original state, but every 15 seconds and 30 seconds you should have interesting looking overlaps. And honestly, this isn't really that hard to get used to once you make the process of making svgs easy because like the whole joy of scripting period is oh i can do that and once you start realizing that you can start to create images or 3d objects with powershell it's just it's beautiful territory to get into and it'll start making things go off in your brain really quickly. And you'll, you'll learn this skill set in a very unique and interesting way. Um, so that's the, my answer on the timings. Does that make sense on what fun optical illusion -y stuff goes on here? I can yeah. also add the bonus point that I used to actually uh, be a professional VJ way back in an early weird period of my life. Uh, so uh, the short way to put that job is I trip people out for a living. This this might be occasionally useful job experience. All right. Well, listen. That, that is kind of the effect, Wayne. That is meant to be the effect. All right. So what I'm going to do here very is sleepy. I'm, I'm, I'm going to step asked in. They're being hypnotized. Sorry. I'm going to step in and say, um, so you sort of burned our brains again, as usual. That's kind of what I expected. But I don't want to go too off the rails. So why don't we wrap this up for a recording and remind well, everybody. I, I got that, a couple slides left. Let me, okay. let me kind of blaze right through them because we've That's shown fine. the logo. Before we all do right, that, I just want to say, I just want to say for the, the people watching. So we, we do this all the time. and so. Um, what we're going to do is when James wraps up here is we're going to end this recording and then we're going to do our own sort of like extra content. And so if you ever want to come and see the extra content, come and join the meeting. Cause James is probably going to show us a bunch of stuff after we finish the recording that goes off the tangent a little bit. We want to stay focused to what the topic was. I'm sorry, James, do what you were doing. Uh You're doing great. That's okay. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm about to talk a little bit like Greek philosophy for a second. Uh, so, and, and also bad dad joke, like Stephen Judd class bad dad joke puns, because we just showed you the logo. So let's talk about logos, pathos, and ethos. But also, I just spent a long time talking about the actual logos, the logical reasons why you should use PipeScript, aka play with every language that exists and generate lots of code instead of writing it all by hand. Not vaguely trusting AI to get it right, but, you know, tried to do true scripts. Pathos and ethos, though. Pathos is, you know, essentially what you think, and ethos is like your ethical framing, why you should be. So the ethos of PowerShell is easier is better. At least it, this is my high-level opinion for what, PowerShell really thinks of itself. The pathos of PowerShell is you feel the power of the pipeline. Look what I can do with this one-liner. 
there was a old PowerShell MVP that had a shirt that was be nice to me or we'll place your job with a single line of script. And you don't have to be that way about it, but yeah, we can do some amazing things with PowerShell. The ethos of PipeScript is make everything easy. Easier really is better. And a lot of languages aren't that easy to use, but have a lot of cool stuff in them. And it would be great if we can take that ethos of PowerShell into the rest of the language world and all of us along with it. And the pathos of TypeScript is we can automate everything. Because I don't know about anybody else on this call, but up until this sort of technology existed, these sorts of tricks were made clear. We were limited by what .NET could do. We couldn't automate everything in PowerShell, but we can automate everything with PypeScript. And we can probably build a PowerShell layer to talk to it on our way. So what's next? As you might get, we are at the tip of a very large iceberg. PypeScript will continue to play nicer with others. It will also continue to grow in power. More things will become language-like. Uh, languages are an open-ended object that has proven very adept as a way to kind of treat things so that I can make them interpretable. Um, more other things make sense to treat this way as well. Interpreters are already very easy to build. They will get easier and more full-featured. Docker will be rocked with PowerShell. Really looking forward to that one. Microservices will be even easier to build than they already are. The world is our oyster. What parts look tasty? Questions, comments, and thoughts. This can be a lot to take in. Questions are encouraged. We'll go back over them in a second. Thoughts should be shared. The repo for this is github.com slash start automating pipe script. You can reach out at james.brundage at start automating.com at James Brewer, at Mr. PowerShell on X, Twitter, or whatever the hell we're calling it these days. Mr. PowerShell about everywhere else, except for Discord, where I am start automating. And any of those are good places to get in touch with me. Questions are welcome starting now. My, I'm done with the dog and pony show. I can stop sharing and restart the memes. Oh, that was great. They were great, uh, James. I really appreciate it. And uh... Yeah, I think we'll 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 finish up the recording here. And uh, for all those who are watching on YouTube, thanks so much. We do meet twice a month. We meet the first week Wednesday of every month and the third Wednesday of every month. Um, please join us. Uh, find us on YouTube. Uh, find us on our website rtpsug.com. And uh, see you next time. Certainly, as Mike said, join us in person, and you'll be able to uh, enjoy the after questions. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks again, James. No problem.